Okay, we're going to open with uh, number 132 in the supplemental hymnal, O Give to Jehovah, You Sons of the Mighty. Now we're going to be led in prayer by Pastor Justin Wallach of Christ Church in Branchville, Alabama. Let's pray. Almighty God and our merciful Father in heaven, we rejoice in this day that you have made and you've given to us, your people. We give you praise for the grace and love that you've shown us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity, this conference, to learn and grow as disciples for Christ's sake. We pray that you would deal bountifully with us, your servants, servants of our Creator, servants of righteousness, that we may live and keep your word. Help us to understand your ways, that we may obey all your commands. Bless your servant, Dr. Lightheart, now with wisdom and clarity to communicate what you would have us learn to serve you. And move us with joy and zeal to go forth in this conference with faithfulness and fruitfulness in our kingdom labors. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, just a couple of brief announcements. I was told I said something incorrect that the lunch today is held here. Lunch tomorrow will be, be held here. The Lotus Club thing starts at 2.30, 2.30 to 6.30 this, this uh, afternoon. So that's the thing. We'll have more information about that. Bart Lismy is going to tell us more about that at the end of our question and answer session today. Please write out your questions. I think we have three so far, which is not nearly enough. They know a lot more than those things. So you got to give some good questions so that we can challenge our speakers. But anyway, we're ready to go for our next session. And so please welcome uh, Dr. Peter Lightheart for his second talk. I'm gratified that uh, Steve did not find any more embarrassing moments in publishing history to share with you all. That's a blessing this morning. We're going to be continuing our studies in the early chapters of the book of Acts. And I want to read from Acts chapter 3. This is Peter's speech in the temple after Peter and John heal the man who had been lame and uh, in front of the temple. 
And then a crowd gathers and Peter gives this speech. Beginning in verse 11 of Acts chapter 3. While he, that is the man, was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them to the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are all witnesses. And on the basis of his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ should suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, to whom you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not heed the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you that you've poured out your spirit on us. We thank you that by your spirit our lives are conformed to the dying and living of Jesus Christ. We thank you that by his spirit, by the spirit of Jesus, our tongues are loosed. So we speak freely before you, before one another, before the world around us. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit so that we would have speech that our enemies cannot overcome, cannot refute, so that your word would go forth in power in our day, even as it did in the days of the early church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The early chapters of Acts see an escalating cycle of opposition to the church. We go through the same cycle of events several times, but each time things get a little more serious for the apostles. Peter and John heal a man who's been lame from birth, in the presence of the temple, right next to the beautiful gate of the temple. And then Peter gives this sermon, this speech that I've just read. The Sanhedrin, the elders and priests of Israel, the Senate of Israel, as it were, gets wind of Peter's speech at the temple. And so the Sanhedrin brings Peter and John into the presence of the Sanhedrin and puts them on trial and asks them to give an account for what they've been doing and warns them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. Don't use this name anymore. And then they let them go. And then the cycle starts again because Peter and John and the rest of the disciples don't stop what they're doing because of the warning that they receive. They go back to the temple. They continue to preach Jesus using the name of Jesus They even expand their ministry. The apostles all are there in the portico of Solomon later on in the early chapters of Acts. They're all there. They're performing signs and wonders. They're healing people. They're casting out demons. They're doing all the things that Jesus himself had done in the temple. 
and they're proclaiming the name of Jesus. So they get hauled in by the Sanhedrin again. This time they're warned again, but this time in addition to a warning, they receive a flogging and they're sent on their way. Preaching, arrest, hearing before the Sanhedrin, warning. Preaching, arrest, hearing before the Sanhedrin, flogging along with the warning. And then Stephen, in the last cycle, is brought in before the Sanhedrin. He gives testimony before the Sanhedrin, and before the trial is over, he's taken out of the city and stoned. Things are getting more and more serious. The opposition is intensifying. And in spite of the intensifying opposition, the apostles continue to preach Jesus, and they continue to do the miracles that the Spirit enables them to to do. And they are doing all this in the most public place imaginable. They're doing it in the center of Israel, the heart of Israel, in the temple, in the courts of the temple. Not, as I said last evening, in some byway, not out in Galilee. That's not where they, where they start their mission. The Spirit falls when they're in an upper room, not at the temple. But as soon as the Spirit falls, they're at the temple, they're doing things. Imagine the chutzpah of the apostles. This is a spiritual gift, chutzpah. You can look it up. That's the original Greek. The audacity of the apostles to go right back to the temple after Jesus had just been arrested and crucified because of what he was doing in the temple. When Jesus came into Jerusalem on, uh, on Palm Sunday, he makes a beeline for the temple. He cleanses the temple. He overturns the tables. He interrupts the temple service as a sign of the coming permanent interruption of temple service. He condemns the temple. And then for a week... He sets up shop in the temple and he performs miracles in the temple and he teaches in the temple and he casts out demons in the temple. And now, less than two months later or about two months later, just when the Sanhedrin thought they had gotten rid of this Jesus threat, his disciples are right back in the temple in an exposed public place, continuing to do exactly what Jesus had done. They've come to the center of Judaism, and they've continued the ministry of Jesus, and they have taken over the temple and made the temple a site of healing and life. They have brought the name back to the temple. You might remember in the Old Testament that that's the point of the temple, in the book of Kings, in going back to Deuteronomy. When you enter the land and I give you peace on every side, then I'm going to choose a place to set my name. And that's where you'll come and you'll celebrate your festivals. That's where you'll come to sacrifice. That'll be the center of your liturgical life, the place where I set my name. That's what a temple is for. It's the dwelling place of the name of Yahweh. And now the apostles are the ones who possess the name and speak the name and do miracles in the name, the name of Jesus. They are the true temple, and that true temple, the living temple, is taking over the old temple. And, of course, the Jews don't like that to happen. They're threatened by that. These are the Jewish leaders who are supposed to be caretakers of the temple. They don't want rivals in the temple they don't want powerful rivals do th doing things they can't do, casting out demons, healing people with your shadow. No priest ever did that, but the apostles do. This is the situation that the apostles find themselves in, escalating opposition, and it looks like initially, on the surface of things, it looks like the opposition is initiated by the Jews, and the, the apostles are reacting to what the Jews do to them. But that's not what's happening. The, the, the apostles take the initiative from the beginning by camping out in the temple, by carrying out their ministry in the temple. The initiative is with the Spirit and with the apostles. The initiative is not with the opponents 
of the apostles and the opponents of the church. It's a good principle to keep in mind. We are always, the church is always on the offensive. The spirit is with us and the spirit blows where he wills. The spirit is the spirit of creation. The spirit leads the church. The spirit is always on the offensive. And if we're keeping step with the spirit, however passive we look in response to the world's opposition, we're actually on the offensive. We're taking the initiative. That's what the apostles are doing. And they're not just provoking by camping out in the temple, in the public places of the temple, in the public porticos of the temple. They're not just taking over the center of Judaism and provoking a reaction in that way. They're provoking because of what they say, because of the speeches that they give. We just heard one from Peter. Peter preaches the gospel to this crowd. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, that's the center of all the apostolic preaching. It's about the God of our fathers, the God of Israel, and what the God of Israel has now done in raising Jesus from the dead. That's the center of their preaching. Every time you hear the apostles preach, they're talking about how what, what has happened in Jesus is the fulfillment and the continuation of exactly what had been foretold by the prophets, what had been foreshadowed by all the Old Testament. In fact, we find in verse 18... What I talked about last night is Peter saying, God announced this beforehand, that his Christ would suffer, and now he's fulfilled that. He's learned the lesson that Jesus taught after his resurrection, that everything that happened to Jesus had to happen, and now everything that's happening to the apostles also has to happen, because they're united to Jesus by the Spirit. This is an evangelistic sermon, and every sermon, every speech that the apostles give is evangelistic. But notice at the center of this speech that this is also a speech of accusation. Peter and, the, Peter and John are in the portico of Solomon, a very public place, and they accuse the Jewish leaders who are in control of that public place of murder. Notice how Peter describes what the Jews did. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You put to death the prince of life whom God raised from the dead to which we're witnesses. Notice the choice that the Jews had. This is the literal choice that the Jews had during the trial of Jesus. Do you want the prince of life you want a murderer. Jesus, the prince of life, or Barabbas, who is a well-known brigand and a murderer. And the Jews, who had been taught from the plains of Moab, when they camped with Moses just before they entered the promised land, they had taught, been taught to choose life. I said before you, life and death. I set before you disaster and blessing. Choose life, choose blessing, Moses says. They have the same choice before them during the trial of Jesus. Life or death. And they chose death. Reject the prince of life. Send him to a Roman cross. They choose death instead of life. And they become a den, a den of murderers. The Sanhedrin is a, they've, they've closed rank in order to protect themselves against this accusation of judicial murder. That's what Peter is charging the leaders of his own people. That's the crime he's charging them with. And because of that, the Jews are in enormous danger, as Peter goes on to say. He quotes from Deuteronomy 18. The Lord is going to send in a prophet like Moses to you. And whoever listens to the prophet will have life. Whoever opposes the prophet and does not hear and obey everything he says will be utterly destroyed from among the people. That's the threat that's hanging over Israel. That's the threat that's hanging over the temple. That's the threat that's hanging over the Sanhedrin. You rejected the prince of life. You've rejected the prophet from God. 
you risk being utterly destroyed. At this point, Peter says, there's still hope. If you repent and return, verse 19, your sins will be wiped away. Times of refreshing will come. You're the children of the covenant. You're the sons of the prophets. You can be restored to the Abrahamic mission, which is to bring blessing to the Gentiles. But you need to repent. And specifically, Peter says, you need to repent of rejecting the prince of life. Repent of this murder that you've committed. Peter's message is an evangelistic message that has universal application. But he also has a very specific message to the Sanhedrin and to the Jewish leaders about their culpability, their guilt in putting Jesus to death. And the promise of cleansing and the wiping away of sins is for Israel specifically. Israel can be restored to their mission, can be restored to God's favor if Israel repents. Many Jews do, including many priests over the course of the mission in Jerusalem and the mission elsewhere. Many Jews repent. And so Israel is restored, but not the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin continues to resist. Peter makes this speech, an evangelistic speech using the controversial name of Jesus and an accusatory speech addressed to the Sanhedrin in particular. He makes this in public in a court of the temple. He speaks the truth. He is filled with the virtue that Luke in chapter 4 calls parousia. P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A is the transliteration of the Greek term parousia. It's come into English, uh, transliterated into English as a description of a certain kind of rhetoric, a certain kind of boldness in speech. Parousia is bold, confident, open speech. Somebody who has the virtue of parousia speaks his mind freely, without hesitation, without flattery, without manipulation or rhetorical tricks. He doesn't bend the truth to his audience, he doesn't hedge. And parousia, in particular, is on display when the person who's speaking is under threat for the words that he's speaking. When he's been warned not to speak, when he's been threatened, if you speak, then this is going to happen to you. The disciples are paragons, exemplars of free, open speech before powers and authorities and governors. They weren't always this way. (laughs) You might remember back to the Gospels and think about the apostles and their degree of boldness and courage in the Gospel story. It's at a fairly low ebb. They're timid. They're confused. Sometimes it seems they're worried that Jesus is speaking a little too openly. Don't you know that you offended the Pharisees by what you said? And Jesus says, yes, I intended to, and I will offend them again. For the apostles, all of that changes after the Spirit comes. Parousia, open, free speech, is a gift of the Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, Peter says, I speak openly to you. That's parousia. I speak with parousia. That's in Acts chapter 2. And The word parousia is almost the last word of the book of Acts. When Paul is under house arrest in Rome, he's speaking the word of God with all openness unhindered. That word openness translates parousia. The whole book of Acts is framed and bracketed by references to this virtue that's a gift of the Spirit. Peter speaks openly, Paul speaks openly. In Paul's letters, he asks the Ephesians to pray for him so that he can speak with parousia before the Gentiles. He says in 2 Corinthians 3 that he speaks with parousia in the church, not just in evangelistic settings when he's out in the world, 
But also within the church, he speaks with unveiled face. Unlike Moses in 2 Corinthians 3, he's contrasting himself with the ministry of Moses. He speaks with unveiled face. He speaks openly in both public settings and in the less public setting of the church. Christians speak freely, openly, without hedging, without hindrance. The Christians speak openly because they are, have open an opening with God. Let us draw near with parousia to the throne of grace, says Hebrews. We have parousia to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Don't throw away your parousia. All those are from the book of Hebrews. We have parousia with God because our hearts don't condemn us, says 1 John. The reason why the early Christians can speak in the power of the Spirit boldly to their enemies in the face of their enemies is because the Spirit has come and given them access to God. They have open access to God and therefore they can speak with openness to human beings without fear. They can approach God without fear. They can approach men without fear. And in this gift of parousia, Jesus fulfills both a command and a promise that he made to his disciples. What I tell you in the darkness, he tells them, speak in the light. What you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim from the housetops. There's a kind of messianic silence that Jesus observes at times in the Gospels. But the apostles are not supposed to do that. Jesus says, what I've whispered to you, what I've told you in secret, go tell everybody. And the disciples do. He promises to give them the spirit so they can fulfill this command. When they bring you before synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about how or what you will speak in your defense or what you're going to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Make up your minds, he says later, not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. That's the promise of Jesus to his disciples. And we see in the book of Acts that that is being fulfilled. The disciples are speaking openly what Jesus had taught them in secret. Jesus is giving them utterance. Jesus is enabling them to speak in a way that their opponents cannot refute or resist. We'll see that a little bit later here uh, in the early chapters of Acts. You'll notice that one of, the, one of the elements of Jesus' promise here is the setting in which they will be asked to speak. When they bring you before governors and kings, don't prepare beforehand what you're going to say. The Spirit will give you utterance. It's going to happen. And Acts is all about that promise coming to pass. The apostles are constantly brought in before governors and kings and rulers. I haven't tabulated, but I think that the most common evangelistic setting in the book of Acts is the courtroom. Maybe the temple would be a second, a close second. Paul preaches on Mars Hill. It's a one-off a couple times they preach in public squares. Paul often is giving testimony to Jesus in courtrooms. Before the Jewish leaders, before kings, before governors. This is not a distraction from the mission. Paul doesn't say, I wish I could get past this courtroom problem, this courtroom drama, and get back to the real mission. That becomes the mission field. That's the place where they're supposed to speak with parousia, to proclaim the name of Jesus. Acts 4 is the New Testament passage that focuses most on parousia. The word is used three or four times in the course of this passage. I don't have my notes right in front of me. I can't remember if it's three or four. It's translated in somewhat different ways as confidence or boldness or something like that. One of the interesting things here is the fact that the Sanhedrin, this is what Acts 4 is describing the first appearance of the apostles before the Sanhedrin. Peter and John 
heal the lame man. Peter gives the speech that I've already read. Then Peter and John are called in before the, uh, before the uh, Sanhedrin and required to give an account. And they're asked to, uh, they're warned not to keep speaking in the name of Jesus. And they say they can't do that. We have to obey God rather than men, they keep telling the disciples, uh, keep telling the Sanhedrin. Peter begins his response to the Sanhedrin with this. This is in chapter 4, verse 8. Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, Rulers, elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. The Spirit makes Peter a little snarky. Let me get this straight. The reason we're standing before the Sanhedrin is because we healed a lame man. We did a a benefit. We blessed a lame man. And that's now become a criminal act. Are we on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man? He names the name of Jesus, the name that they're not supposed to speak. And as soon as he names the name of Jesus, he's immediately into accusation mode. Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified and God raised from the dead. He's making, he's evangelizing, he's speaking the name of Jesus. He's also charging the Sanhedrin with murder once again. They do it again. Peter and all the apostles appear in chapter 5. They appear and, uh, before the Sanhedrin again. And they're told, you've been spreading this, spreading this report and bringing blame for the blood of Jesus on us. You should stop saying such things and stop naming the name of Jesus. And then chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you, you put to death by hanging on the tree. He's the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Again, the gospel, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus and also the accusation. You put him to death. No wonder the Sanhedrin wants to stop them. Not only are they rivals, lots of people are beginning to follow the apostles, but they're going around the city of Jerusalem accusing the Sanhedrin repeatedly of murder. And when the apostles are confronted with this, the apostles do not back down. Stop talking about Jesus. We can't. We must be witnesses of what we've seen. We're telling you to stop. The Sanhedrin. We can't. We must obey God rather than men. Do your worst. We will keep speaking the name. You're charging Jesus' blood to us. Yes, we are. You put him to death. You put him on the tree. This is parousia. This is bold, spirit-filled speech in the face of opposition and hatred, a hatred that by the time they get to this second hearing has boiled up into a murderous rage. After the apostles are finished with this speech, the Sanhedrin are cut to the quick, And repent in sackcloth and ashes. No, they don't. They're cut to the quick and intend to kill them. Peter knows that he receives this gift from the Spirit. He speaks in the Spirit. He speaks with paresi in the Spirit. And this obedience to the Spirit's urging and leading leads to a greater filling of the Spirit. Notice in in chapter 5, verses 29 to 32. This is Peter's speech representing the apostles' before the Sanhedrin in their second hearing. We must obey God rather than men, he says in verse 29. And specifically, we have to obey God in proclaiming the name of Jesus. And we have to obey God in speaking the truth about how Jesus was killed and speaking the truth about your involvement in it. And then notice at the end of his speech, verse 32. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given 
to those who obey him. Obey him how? Well, obey him in general. But also those who obey him by not buckling to the pressure of the apostles. Those who obey God rather than men. God gives the spirit to those who obey God in that way. Peter speaks with Parisia because he's filled with the Spirit. When he speaks with Parisia, that's obedience to God, and God gives him the Spirit, which allows him to speak with even more boldness, which means an even greater filling of the Spirit. You get this virtuous cycle going. Obedience leads to a fuller gift of the Spirit, which leads to greater obedience, which leads to a fuller gift of the Spirit. And just as the, Jesus had promised, no one can silence them. The apostles here are evangelists, but they're also prophets. Remember the Old Testament prophets. They would stand before kings and governors and accuse kings and governors of breaking the covenant, of breaking the commandments of God, of abusing the poor, of abusing people like Naboth, Elijah before Ahab, accusing him of putting Naboth to death. That's what the apostles are doing here. They are evangelists. They are also prophets. They are prosecuting attorneys, bringing the charges against the, against the Sanhedrin. And it doesn't matter how many threats they get. They keep speaking with Parasia. I started to say this a few minutes ago, but then I realized I had skipped some things, so I went back and filled in. It's interesting. One of the interesting things, remember I said that? And then you thought... What was the interesting thing? And I, I was left wondering, what was that interesting thing I was going to say? Here's the interesting thing I was going to say. I hope you'll find it interesting too. The first time Parisia is used in chapter 4, it's the, uh, it's the evaluation of the Sanhedrin of the confidence and the openness of the disciples. They recognize Parisia in the disciples. This is Acts 4, chapter 13, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they observed the parasia of Peter and John and understood they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. How dare these fishermen, untrained in the schools of Torah, unlearned, How dare they speak this way before the scribes and the chief priests and the leaders of Israel? Where did they get this confidence? They get this confidence because they've been with Jesus. Jesus' parasia is infectious, contagious, contagious with the contagion of the Spirit. Jesus speaks with boldness and openness because he's filled with the Spirit and then he gives that Spirit to his disciples. The Sanhedrin recognizes the boldness of the apostles and they also recognize, as Jesus promised, that they have nothing to say in response. This is another part of the interesting thing that I meant to say. They recognize Parasia and then they realize that they can't refute what the disciples are saying. Notice in chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, standing with the apostles, they had nothing to say in reply. The man was well known because he'd been begging outside the temple gates. Everybody knew him as a lame man, and now he's standing there with the apostles. What are they going to do? Well, one thing you do, Presbyterians know this. You go into executive session. You try to avoid the scrutiny of the public. They see the layman. They order them to leave the council. The apostles are ordered out. They confer with one another. And notice what they say, verse 16. What should we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. They know that they can't refute the apostles. There's too much evidence, the evidence of their own eyes, the evidence of all the reports that are spreading throughout Jerusalem. They can't refute the apostles. So the only choice, of course, 
You have two choices. You can accept the apostles' testimony. Oh, this was Jesus. We need to get on Jesus' good side. Or you start some information management, which is what they do. They begin to try to control the apostles. When you can't refute, you mandate. When you can't refute, you start condemning and threatening. The the Sanhedrin does not like being exposed to these accusations. Tyrants never like exposure. None of us like exposure. Exposure brings shame. When our wrongs are brought to light, we want to fight back and protect ourselves, compounding our sin. The only way to life when you're ashamed is to seek the covering that Jesus provides, the covering of his blood. The apostles, the the Sanhedrin doesn't want that. So we can't refute them. We can't deny it. So just tell them not to talk about it anymore. They are more concerned about maintaining and controlling their power and controlling the narrative than they are about the truth. This is not a suppression of disinformation. And they know it. They know they're not suppressing disinformation. They're suppressing the truth. But they still do it. Because to admit the truth would be to admit that they murdered the prince of life. And they chose death over life. And they would have to begin to cede some of their authority. They would have to experience the shame of repentance. They can't have that. And so they begin to suppress the apostles. They not only know that they can't refute the apostles, but they already have enough information to know that something absolutely unprecedented is going on with Jesus. The next time the apostles are before the Sanhedrin, later on in chapter 5, they go into executive session again. Good trick, always. And Gamaliel speaks to them. And Gamaliel, Gamaliel reminds them of a couple of incidents that had taken place earlier in in the history of Israel. Remember Thutis and Judas. They rose up. They thought they were somebody. They gained a following. Lots of people followed them. Then they died, and their followers were scattered. This was of men, and therefore it came to an end. Judas and Thutis. Same story in both cases. Also with Jesus. Jesus rises up, gains a following, thinks he's somebody. Then he dies. And his apostles scatter. But then the story starts to change. The apostles regather. And now the Sanhedrin is still having to deal with the apostles, the, the, the followers of this discredited, crucified Messiah. They have enough evidence to conclude that this Jesus, whatever he is, is not just another Thutis or Judas. If he were, we wouldn't have these disciples and, follow, and apostles to deal with. They'd be gone. But they don't have, even though they have all the evidence they need to recognize that Jesus is different from these earlier leaders, they won't accept it. They're protecting their their speech police, their thought police, like every tyrant. I think I probably have said enough to to, uh, briefly describe what I think the import of all this is for us. It's been a long time in America since courtrooms were evangelistic locations for Christians. But they are going to be evangelistic settings for Christians. Especially those of you who are under 20. There are some of you here who are going to be brought in before school boards, local authorities, before your human resources officer, your diversity officer at the company you work for, and you're going to have to give an account. Why didn't you put the 
rainbow flag up during Pride Month. Why did you call your colleague, the one with the beard, why did you call him he instead of his chosen pronoun? You're a bigot. Give an account of yourself. This is happening. It's going to happen more. And that is not a deviation from the mission of the church. It's another setting for us to proclaim the name of Jesus and to proclaim the word of God. And we need to prepare ourselves for those kinds of settings. We need to be ready so that when we're called in, the spirit is with us and will give us the words to speak in that moment as Jesus promised. How do you get ready? Jesus says, don't prepare your speech ahead of time. Speak extemporaneously, but you can prepare. Stay close to Jesus. The forthright, open speaker. He is the word. And he speaks without hindrance, without hedging, no matter what kinds of threats. Stay close to Jesus. and Pick up some of his contagious boldness. Walk in the Spirit. Pray for the Spirit. After the apostles are taken before the Sanhedrin, they go back to the group of the apostles who are praying for them. And the apostles pray that God would put down the opposition, but they pray more importantly for boldness to speak the gospel, the word of God. Pray for parousia. Pray for openness and boldness of speech. Of course, you're going to be in situations where you're called to give an account. This is not imaginary for us in the 21st century. But the Spirit is still with us, as I said last night. The same Spirit who filled the apostles, those timid apostles, the same Spirit who filled them with parasy, with all boldness and all openness, will fill you and give you words to say words that cannot be refuted or resisted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your grace to us through your Son, Jesus. We thank you for your Spirit that you poured out on us. We pray that your Spirit would equip us to speak with all boldness, that we wouldn't hedge or back down, that we would speak your word in whatever situation, whatever threats, come our way so that Jesus Christ would be exalted and his name would be proclaimed before governors and kings and all authorities that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Let's take a quick break. We'll start our question and answer session at 1145.